Natalie Broger. And I'm Stephen Ward, and this is Spoke TV, your source for local and campus news. Water bills recently went up by 9.5% in Cambridge, and residents aren't happy. The increase is to help raise money for the much-needed repairs on the infrastructure. But is money really going where it needs to be? Here's Sean Cassidy with the story. Making ends meet is getting tougher, especially for those on a fixed income, like Cambridge homeowner Joe McBaron. They give you an increase, you know, of cost of living, but believe you me, that cost of living increase does not meet the cost of living. What is the cost of living? An increase of only 1.5% for someone like McBaron. The city's water prices have grown almost 40% over the past few years. Now with another jump of more than 9% and approximately a 4% increase on property tax each year to fund the city's needs. And I'm, I'm real totally against them. You know, they've got to stop cutting back on, on half of the government uh, people that they have. Less city staff? George Elliott, project engineer with the city, says there is more to the water bill hike than just needed repair. This year, uh, was a little bit of additional uh, deliberation by council, uh, primarily because of the additional staff that was being added to the budget. Council voted 6-3 to three in favour of the increase. Director of Communications with the City, Linda Fagan, tells us people like McBaron are considered during the construction of these proposals. Absolutely. I mean, every demographic of our city is important to us, and we recognize that seniors have fixed incomes and, and are struggling. We advocate for many services outside of um, the, the ones we provide to ensure that the governments that we partner with are listening about that. Whether you can afford it or not, Nobody likes to see an increase in their bills, but there's no question the infrastructure needs to be fixed. On the average water bill, $7 a month isn't a big increase. Overall, that's $4.5 million at year-end for the city. However, after paying the region for supplying water and treatment, only $1.2 million goes back into repair on the infrastructure. For Spoke TV, I'm Sean Cassidy. Local residents are devastated as Hydro One went into the community and cut down 6% of Waterloo's canopy. Concerned residents say a lack of awareness and concern for the removal of this green life allowed the clear cutting to take place. Jackson Wagner visited the bare location of where many trees and wildlife used to prosper. What used to be Keatswood Park is now just dirt, sticks and machine marks after Hydro One has upset residents by cutting down the hundreds of trees that used to be along this pathway. Spoke TV got a chance to talk with Kathleen Lambert, who was largely involved in the protest against Hydro One. It's constant human traffic back there, and now it's a wasteland, which is what we tried to tell everybody and warn them way back in June. Hydro One requires that there be 10 feet of clearance beneath power lines, and residents say that these trees were nowhere near that tall. Another resident, Brian Faulkner, gave his view on what he feels the park has become. Yeah, they took out all of the sumac that was planted by Ontario Hydro. They just devastated the area and it's just a big wasteland. Looks like a war zone is what it looks like. Just everything chewed to heck, trees gone, all the environment for the birds are gone. We really saw that impact in the first couple of days here when they were taking out all the sumacs and everything, all of a sudden the birds were flocking into our areas. I was seeing hundreds of birds that I hadn't seen before because I got nowhere to go now. In what was once a beautiful walkway for school children, hikers, cyclists, and dog walkers, is now a barren wasteland of dirt, sticks, and garbage that is no longer appealing to the eye and disheartening to the residents. Now, when I was talking to the guy from the city, too, he said, between what Hydro One has done here and the loss of the oak, you know, the ash trees, um, we're going, we have lost approximately 6% of our canopy for Waterloo. And it will take 30 to 50 years to replace that. These guys are here to destroy, not to destroy the environment, not, not build it up. That's what I believe. Hydro One declined to comment on the matter saying that they are involved in many vegetation management projects. 
Rising water costs and clear-cutting trees aren't the only things upsetting people of Waterloo Region. On Monday night, concerned residents took to the streets to protest the installation of XL Pipeline under the Grand River. Spoke TV reporter Daryl Vandenberg found out what all the fuss was about. The group consisted of concerned residents of Waterloo and members of a group called Stop Tar Sands KW that also work in partnership with the Tar Sands Blockade. Many passionate words were spoken. When toxic issues arise, a spill or an alarm, there's no protocol to follow to really connect with the people. This was the first of their gatherings, and the founder of the movement, Paisley Kozarin, hopes to get as much exposure as possible. We're going to be trying to lobby the Ontario government to do a formal assessment of the pipeline, which is what Quebec is doing, because the second half of the pipeline runs through Quebec. So the Quebec, Quebec government is doing a formal assessment before they'll approve it. The fight against the tar sands has been going on for years, opposing any economic benefits. Waterloo protesters want to stand their ground. We really want to show the Ontario government and the Canadian government, as well as our local municipalities, that we really care about Line 9 and we really don't want to see tar sands oil in Ontario. Stop the Tar Sands KW has made a Facebook presence as well as local exposure. For Spoke TV, I'm Daryl Vandenberg. Even though Waterloo is home to two major universities and a college, the community is putting the term starving students to rest with the church's charitable idea to feed local students. Marcus Wolf brings us the story from Thursday's Feeding Frenzy Dinner. Every Thursday night at the Waterloo Pentecostal Assembly on King Street, you'll find the Feeding Frenzy, a place for students to get a free meal. But more importantly, according to Spencer Houghton, it's all about the community. Uh, over 100 people in this room. You get to see friends. Um, and like, when, usually when people eat together, you know, there's a sense of community and they get to know each other a little bit better. Um, commensality comes to mind, you know, eating together and living together and being in the same communities. On the menu for this evening, they offered pasta for both vegetarians and meat lovers, Caesar salad, garlic bread available in a gluten-free portion, and for dessert, homemade apple crisp. The feeding frenzy has been going on for the past 11 years, last two of which young adult pastor Kim Davis has been in charge. Davis explains how the feeding frenzy started just with someone wanting to make a difference in our community. And we're situated in a really cool place with um, two universities and a college. And so one of the greatest community needs is obviously towards students and what do students need? Food. <laughs> so feeding students was kind of just the most sensible answer. After the students file out, the volunteers that come in here every Thursday clean up after them because it's been another successful evening at the Feeding Frenzy. For Spoke TV, I'm Marcus Wolf. Being a journalist, I was honored this week when I had a chance to speak with the man, the legend, Lloyd Robertson. On Monday, the city of Waterloo played host to Lloyd Robertson at the Knox Presbyterian Church with over 400 people in attendance to listen to the broadcast legend speak about his life. Hosted by CTV's province-wide Diane Verniel and was put on by the local bookstore Wordworth Books, we spoke with co-owner Mandy Browse. Uh, Harper Collins originally mentioned that he would be available for touring at very select places. So I think in this area it's been Stratford and Waterloo and in Toronto and that's about it I think. So we jumped on that right away. Also in attendance, Robertson's wife Nancy Robertson of 55 years. We had a chance to talk with her about her role she played in her husband's career. Well I used to say, you know why our marriage has lasted so long? Because we don't see all that much of each other. It's nice having him home at night. Good. It's really nice having him home at night. But people forget that he was always home till about 2.30. So we always had lunch together and breakfast together. And he made it home for dinner quite often. Robertson spent the night reading and entertaining the crowd. With over 60 years in the business, Lloyd Robertson's seen it all. With his new memoirs, The Kind of Life It's Been, he regales the readers with his humble beginnings in Stratford all the way to his rise to the top of Canadian broadcasting. I had a moment to sit with Lloyd and talk to him about writing his new book. It's a wonderful business to be in because you're right in the center of things all the time. You're following the parade as it passes by. And um, it was interesting for me because I had to turn myself inside out because I've always been following the passing parade and suddenly as the subject of the book, I was the parade. So uh, what I had to do was sit and watch my own life go by. And once I got used to that idea, 
it, I was able to sit down at the keyboard and it just began to flow. And it was a lot of fun to write in the end. That must have been a great experience. It really was one of the moments that I will always remember. I grew up watching Lloyd Robertson deliver the news to the nation, and he's one of the big reasons I got into journalism. He's truly an inspiration. Lloyd wasn't the only celebrity who was in town this week. Santa Claus was as well. Our reporter Nicole Picton took in the sights and sounds in Kitchener, Waterloo, and Cambridge. It's a beautiful day in downtown Kitchener, and I'm at the 53rd annual Christmas Parade, where everybody is here to see the big man himself. There's no snow on the ground, but I could definitely feel the Christmas spirit in the air. It was a magical weekend in the KW as thousands of people lined King Street just to catch a glimpse of Santa Claus. The Lions Club of Kitchener organizes this annual event with over 46 floats, 12 marching bands, and more than 100 groups participating. After taking part in the morning parade in Kitchener-Waterloo, many of these same groups made their way to Cambridge for the nighttime parade. It was a special surprise to see Chip and Dale and Elmo and the Cookie Monster dancing their way through. With these annual events bringing so many people together, it was the perfect time to bring donations for the food bank. Bonnie Dion, Fund Development Coordinator of Cambridge Food Bank, says that these contributions really help them prepare for the busy Christmas season ahead. About 1,800 families, and over the next four or five weeks, um, th that's going to increase. And so the, the food that we've collected um, this past weekend is really going to come in handy to be able to help support all those families that are in need over the next few weeks. Although the Grinch was trying to steal the show, the children were really there to see jolly old St. Nick. For Spoke TV, I'm Nicole Picton. If Santa coming to town got you in a festive mood, you can put your holiday spirit to work by donating to the Knights of Columbus New Toys for Needy Kids Toy Drive. Meredith Taylor went out to Cambridge Centre for the first of four toy drives taking place in the KW this holiday season. The Cambridge Centre Mall is spreading holiday cheer this Christmas season by holding a toy drive. In its third year, this annual Villa Cruiser Toy Drive event is put on by the Waterloo Regional Police. It's held to collect toys for children in need. They also accept money donations. Just in its kickoff day, hopefully this year's toy drive will be as big of success as last year's. Actually, last year we had a surplus of toys, um, so we actually helped the people in Goderich that suffered through the storm there last year. So we had a surplus of toys, so we ended up helping a lot of people in other communities. If you'd like to help, you can stop off at the Waterloo Region Police Station to donate to this cause. Donators get a free photo with Santa. Santa Claus has a few years' experience with toy drives as they help him deliver Christmas joy. So how do you get on Santa's good list this Christmas? Well, at Christmas time, they, hey, the, the police here have a, a cru stuff the cruiser night. And that means that you bring a gift in, and you can get a, the police car stuffed with toys. That's getting on the good list. For Spoke TV, I'm Meredith Taylor. That's all we have for you this week. For Spoke TV, I'm Stephen Ward. And I'm Allie Brogan. For more campus news, visit SpokeOnline.com.